Welcome to chapter eight. This chapter is titled Becoming the Woman or Man You Want to Be. I think it might be more appropriately titled Becoming the Person You Want to Be, but nonetheless, in this uh, chapter, we are going to try to realize the role of socialization in defining gender role identity. We are going to critically evaluate traditional notions of being a male or female. We're going to challenge stereotypes and appreciate the role of choice in defining yourself. We're going to consider alternative gender role models and become aware of how gender roles impact relationships. So as we go through this chapter, it's important that you ask yourself how gender roles and gender norms in our society have shaped your behaviors, thoughts, and feelings, not only about yourself, but about others. Let's begin by defining gender. Gender is the state of being female or male. It's helpful to think of gender as being on a continuum rather than being in two boxes um, like male and female, but instead a continuum where you have masculinity at one end and femininity at the other end, and then we can recognize that people fall in different locations within that continuum. So gender is something learned, developed, and constructed based on our self-concept, our society, and the culture in which we live. It's also possible that it's dependent on genetic and or biological factors. Uh, research is still investigating how we develop our gender, and there's evidence that it is a combination of nature and nurture. Um, gender identity is defined as a subjective feeling of femaleness or maleness which most often is consistent with one's biological sex, but of course not always. And our gender identity really develops by about age four, and it's a fundamental component to our overall identity, the way we see ourselves, the way we behave, the way that we think, and the way that we feel. And so part of the way in which we develop our gender identity is based on how our uh, society conditions us, which we can refer to as gender role socialization. So this is the process of learning those behaviors, like the norms and roles, that are expected of people in a particular society. Our socialization in general happens before we are even born. Um, we, our parents already pick out names for us or start buying clothes for us or decorate our nursery, and all of these can relate to um, the gender identity that they think we should have based on uh, our biological sex. And then this gender role socialization continues through life via our parents, our peers, our teachers, and the media. Um, one of the reasons that people kind of conform to this gender role socialization is because knowing someone's gender makes us feel like we can better predict their behavior, and that gives us the illusion of control within our environment. Um, so some of the different ways that we develop our gender role, as already mentioned, is through our parents. Um, and one thing that we know from research is that parents describe their babies differently based on sex. They de uh, describe their female babies as being soft, pretty, and small, and their boy infants are described as being big and strong and determined. So children are directed into these gender-appropriate behaviors and often directed away from things not considered gender appropriate. Um, in terms of toys, we'll see that girls are given dolls and boys are given trucks. In terms of bedroom colors, we'll see that girls' rooms are painted pink and purple and boys' rooms are painted blue and green. In terms of clothes, we'll see that even before the child is born, the mother expecting a female child will get dresses and the uh, mother expecting the male child will get jeans and bow ties and more traditionally masculine clothing items. Another interesting study found that kids are more likely to get the gifts that they ask for if they are gender appropriate. So if a boy asks for a doll, he's much less likely to get that than if he were to ask for a truck that was the exact same price. Um, another interesting fact is that 90% of Halloween costumes are gender traditional. Um, and 10% are gender neutral. So they have witches for girls, and they have Dracula for boys. It's very difficult to find gender neutral costumes. Mothers tend to interact with greater emotional warmth towards girls and tend to encourage independence in boys. And fathers tend to spend more time and play rougher with boys than they do with girls. 
Another interesting study found that parents rated their daughters as being best at English once they were in elementary school, and their sons as being best at math and sports. We also know that teachers do the same thing. However, when we study this, we usually find that all children are actually performing equally well in these areas. Another way in which we are socialized uh, to fit a particular gender role is by our peers. By the time we're five, our peers have more influence over us than our parents. And research shows that children who do not conform to the same gender play as their same-sex friends are often rejected. So if all the girls are playing house and uh, you don't want to play house, um, but you'd rather play soccer, then you tend to be rejected. Boys learn controlling tactics from peers. They use commands, threats, and physical strength to gain compliance from their peers where females learn what psychologists call obliging strategies, polite requests, and subtle verbal requests to gain compliance. Another way in which we're socialized is by our teachers. Teachers often report being gender blind, but unknowingly they engage in gender biases all the time. In fact, they tend to give more uh, attention to boys and they give more time to boys. Um, in problem solving, teachers are more likely to give a girl the answer, but encourage a boy to keep working on it. And then we have the media, um, and television has assumed a very powerful place in the socialization of, of children. It's as significant as family and peers. In fact, one study found the more TV watched, the more typical gender stereotypes a person will develop. So let's watch a video clip on gender role socialization. I want to introduce you to my two little cousins, Alex and Elena. Here's Alex, all wide-eyed, probably because the Bears actually won a game. <laughs> and then here's Elena in her little pink outfit. Now, the outfits help because it's some kind, sometimes it's hard to determine which one's which because they look so similar. But this is where our gender communication to children begins. Now imagine for a moment, recall a time when you or maybe someone you know told a young boy to stop crying or to suck it up or encouraged a young girl to play with Barbies instead of a toy truck. From the beginning, we set an either-or path for our children, a one or another, when it comes to clothes, toys, or actions. It either is or isn't okay to cry. And you either play with Hot Wheels or you play with Barbies. We use gender as a way to construct our children's reality. Now, the work of a communication scholar James Carey tells us that communication is a symbolic process whereby our realities are produced, maintained, repaired, and transformed. Now, I'm not here to say that the communication we're having with our children is invaluable, nor am I even here to paint the world yellow. But what I am here to do is encourage a breakaway from that gender dichotomy. By communicating what we believe is appropriate language, clothes, attire, actions to our children, we're giving a symbolic message as to what it means to be a man and a woman. Our communication produces it. Our re reinforcement of that communication maintains it. And yet, by changing the way we speak and act, we can transform it. Communicating macho manhood to young boys and communicating submissiveness to young girls just won't cut it. We, by communicating that, are really sending strong signs to our young boys and young girls as to what it means to be a man and a woman. Now, let's face it. We tell children what they should do and what they should be, but not so much what they can do or what they can be. We use gender as something that we must fit into, masculinity, for men and femininity for females, when really gender is so fluid with so many different possibilities and combinations that anybody can fit into it. Now, I do want to show you a picture of Lena today. And as you can imagine, the pictures I showed you earlier were two pictures of the same little girl. But it's amazing how much we relied on our minds and communicating gender to tell us a little bit about difference. Now, I'm here to tell you that we need to really think about 
the way we communicate gender to our children. We have a responsibility to, um, to think about the ways that we talk about gender and to make sure that we're communicating it in, liberate, in liberative, positive ways so that we can have a society that doesn't see gender and a society that communicates gender in more positive tones for a more diverse, just world. Thank you. Sexism is defined as a bias against people on the basis of their gender, and it doesn't just affect us in childhood, but it actually affects us our whole lives. The most common form of sexism is women being discriminated against men, but of course, men can also be discriminated against by women, and then there's discrimination within genders as well. So there's something called the gender similarity hypothesis, and it's actually a research that shows that men and women are significantly more similar than different on almost all psychological factors. For example, women are allowed to cry when they're emotional more often than men, even though there's absolutely no biological trait that makes them different in regards to crying. So let's watch a video now that discusses this gender uh, similarity hypothesis. Outside of the world of stand-up comedy, are men and women really that different? Not according to this new study, which suggests that we're pretty much exactly the same. Hey guys, Lacey here. And Trace, and seriously, the jokes about how men and women are different can finally be put to rest. That's right. A new study released this week in the Journal of Social Psychology found that men and women aren't from Mars or Jupiter or Venus and that we're both actually from Earth. But... If we're not from Mars, that's like my only shot to get to go there. Sorry, we're not saying that men and women are exactly the same. I mean, there are obviously physical differences like hip to waist ratio and whatnot. We're talking psychologically, where we're actually pretty similar. Yeah, the researchers at the University of Rochester analyzed 13 published studies and then compiled it with their own data for 122 different characteristics from empathy to extroversion, scientific inclination to sexuality. The statistical analysis of over 13,000 individuals found that gender stereotypes aren't really entrenched in our lived reality. So, for instance, women were not significantly more intimate in relationships, men weren't overwhelmingly more scientifically inclined, and so on. Gender can be a predictor of stereotypes, but these psychologists suggested that the ideas are socially encouraged through a reward and punishment system, you know, approval, disapproval. On some social level, we expect to see behavior based on gender, so in our mind, we make it happen. Another foundational tenet in the field of human sexuality is that people, gender, and even sex don't fit neatly into little boxes. People are complicated. Women exhibit masculine traits like being assertive and competitive and demonstrating leadership, and men exhibit feminine traits like being domesticated, nurturing, and empathetic. Both genders have both characteristics. It's just sort of a continuum. And like the researchers said, it's not really categorical. It's more a matter of degree. So Trace, what do you think about this groundbreaking revelation? Well, even in this study, they found overlap. Like you said, it's not that women are displaying man traits or men are acting more woman-like. It's more that we think that might be what's happening, but in our heads, we're just overlapping all the time. It's, we're just being human-like, human-ish. Yeah. When you think about it, those characteristics are sort of arbitrary anyway. They're mm -hmm. human characteristics. Absolutely. So we realize that for some folks, this kind of research is controversial, and for others, it's common sense. So we want to know what you think about it, if you have any thoughts in your brain. And make sure you subscribe to DNews so you can get all of our awesome videos, two a day, every day of the week. So thanks for watching. See you later. Okay, for lecture activity one for this chapter, chapter eight, I would like for you to tell me uh, two things you learned from the video about ways in which males and females are similar. Um, and then I'd also like for you to tell me one of the ways in which you think males and females are different. So just go ahead and give me a sentence or two on each of those. So two ways the video discussed uh, how both genders are similar, and then I'd like for you to give me one way in which you think genders are different. So there are also people that identify as what is known as third gender, or in our culture referred to as transgender. So third genders are common in other cultures uh, like South Asia, Mexico, Thailand, all over the world. And even in other cultures, 
third genders face issues of discrimination and violence, just like American transgenders. So common areas of discrimination include employment, health care, and housing. Many transgenders actually try to suppress their feelings at first, but living a lie eventually becomes too uncomfortable. And so the process of becoming openly transgender can go great for some people, but can be terrifying and even dangerous for others. You may start out with people wearing opposite sex clothing occasionally or consistently just as a way to feel comfortable within their own skin. In this case, cross-dressing is not a sexual fetish because they're not sexually aroused by it. It's just a way to feel like they match their gender. Transitioning with surgeries and hormones is a very long and expensive process, but many people report feeling emotionally and mentally he healthier after. In fact, sex assignment surgeries from female to male um, are upwards of $50,000 and take years to complete. Um, and, and in terms of um, sex reassignment surgeries for males to females, it's about $24,000 on average and also takes several years to complete. So most transgenders uh, try to suppress or hide their transgender identity until they're in their teens or later. In the last 10 years, research of transgender children has actually increased. And what we found is that transgender children have behaviors far beyond just playing with opposite sex toys. They don't like their name. They won't play with sex conforming toys and activities. They get mad when they're called son or daughter. Um, you know, that's opposite of how they identify. They hate the appearance of their genitals, and they will say that they are uh, the gender that they identify with, which is opposite of their biological sex. In fact, one, one transgender five-year-old tucked her penis between her legs and declared to her mom, I'm a girl. While praying, the mom said, God made you a boy for a special reason, and she said, God made a mistake. Research shows that when parents don't allow children to identify with their gender, the kids often become angry, sad, and withdrawn. Uh, many parents facilitate the child's gender identity, and afterwards they say they're happy they did. Once the child hits puberty, it's difficult for them as they develop sex characteristics that don't match their identity. And so doctors can introduce things called puberty blockers, which halt the sex characteristics from developing. Um, but it's not until age 16 that they are e able to even start considering hormone therapy to begin the transition process. So let's watch a video now on um, the brains of transgender uh, individuals. With the wonderful Laverne Cox rising to fame and Bruce Jenner's groundbreaking interview, transgender issues are finally making it mainstream. So naturally, we're going to science this up. Hi everyone, Julia and Julian here for D News. Transgender means a person identifies as a gender other than what they were assigned at birth. Cisgender, on the other hand, are those who identify as the same gender they were assigned at birth. Unfortunately, being trans is a much more difficult path than being cis. Transgender individuals face a world filled with violence, erasure, and ignorance. But by being true to themselves, they open up a road for so many others to follow. Still, why would anyone purposefully subject themselves to a life of difficulty? Well, it's not a choice. It's who they are, and science can back that up. One study published in the Journal of Neuroscience identified networks in the brain associated with gender. Using diffusion-based magnetic resonance tomography imaging, the researchers looked at the brains of people who are transgender as well as female and male controls. They found microstructures or connections to the brain that differed significantly between the male and female subjects. However, the networks in the brains of those who identified as transgender seemed to take up a middle position. The researchers also found a link between these networks and the amount of testosterone in the bloodstream, suggesting that sex hormones affect how these structures form in the brain, which is supported by earlier research. Right. Some regions of the brain show difference based on gender. In one study published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, scientists used MRI techniques to scan the brains of 18 people who were assigned female but identify as male, and 24 male and 19 female heterosexual controls. The researchers found that the white matter of female to male individuals who received no hormone therapy more more closely resembled brains of the male subjects than the female subjects. Another study by that same research group, also published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, focused on those who were assigned male at birth but identified female. The researchers used similar techniques as the other study and found that their white matter microstructures fell between the measurements of male and female subjects. One of the authors of the study concluded, their brains are not completely masculinized and not completely feminized, but they still feel female. 
And if it's a matter of brain wiring, a lot of kids would know early, and they do. In one study published in the Graduate Journal of Social Science found that 76% of participants knew they were transgender before they left elementary school. A small study published in the journal Psychological Science found that kids as young as five who identify as trans showed a consistency in gender identity across various measures. I actually saw Laverne Cox speak at an event at Rutgers and she said exactly the same thing. The researchers asked 32 transgender kids aged 5 to 12 questions about gender and under the implicit association test to see how kids identify with various things. Using the IAT, the researchers could see how quickly the kids associated gender with the concepts of me and not me. It's a fast test, so they don't have a lot of time to think about it, they just respond. The researchers found that the kids' responses were indistinguishable from their cisgendered peers. The transgender girls responded the same as cisgender girls, and the transgender boys responded just like the cisgender boys. The researchers concluded that their study provided clear evidence to support that transgender children are not confused, delayed, pretending, or oppositional. They instead show responses entirely typical and expected for children with their gender identity. We know that gender is a complex and varied issue. Even Facebook recognized that reality. To learn more about that, check out this video right here. So in addition to a variety of new trans options, including trans man, trans woman, and trans person, Facebook now also includes intersex, gender fluid, pangender, and more. All right, got any questions on gender and sexuality? Leave some down in the comments below, and we could answer it in a future video. Just remember Wheaton's Law, guys. Come on. Also, like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode of DNews. In an effort to combat gender stereotypes, um, counselors are being encouraged to promote something called positive masculinity. Um, and these are positive and strength-based qualities of men that are encouraged to be given center stage um, when boys and men are being counseled. And the focus is on applying a strength-based approach to understanding and counseling men. And so positive masculinity helps men to find their own comfortability within their masculinity not what society says they should be like. So it focuses on their present capacities and resources and identifies the qualities that empower men. They focus on the ways that all men are capable, creative, kind, not just on how they shouldn't feel or act, like they shouldn't cry, they shouldn't be nurturing, um, but instead focuses on all of the different aspects of humanity that they are able to tap into. And so it encourages men to be self-aware and accepting of women as equals. Um, in Western cultures, men are really socialized to avoid behaviors or feelings that are considered uh, typically feminine. So they're encouraged to engage in activities that are outdoors, sports, physical play. They're expected to be competitive, tough, unemotional, independent, and in control. And they're really encouraged not to be vulnerable and empathetic, but this is actually very unhealthy. Emotions that are stuffed down come out eventually, and they usually come out in harmful ways. So positive masculinity is about teaching boys that being vulnerable is an act of courage, and that being empathetic is a good thing and not just a feminine quality. Let's watch this video clip on men and crying. They say boys don't cry, but have you ever seen old Yeller? <laughs> hey boys and girls, Jules here for D News. Babies cry, children cry, and doves cry. But under no circumstances are boys supposed to cry. It just isn't manly, we're told. It's something that women do, apparently. But it turns out, that's not quite true. In fact, studies show that from infancy until around age five, boys express their feelings more than girls. A 1999 study by Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital found that boys were more likely than girls to fuss, ask to be picked up, and most importantly, cry. So if you wanna be very literal, boys do cry. But what happens after age five? Do they slowly become less emotional until they're stoic pillars of strength and officially a man? That doesn't seem to be the case either. One study by Psychology Research Institute Mind Lab gathered a group of 15 fathers and mothers and showed them a series of videos. The researchers categorized the videos as either funny, exciting, blissful, or heartwarming. While they watched the videos, participants' emotional responses were monitored by electrodes on their fingers. 
The electrodes recorded marginally higher responses for men when they watched blissful, funny, or exciting videos. But when the men watched a soldier coming home to his daughter, they were a mess inside, recording twice the physiological response women did. Men are still emotional on the inside, even more so than women, it would seem, but they don't show it. That MindLab study surveyed the men and women after they watched the videos, and men consistently self-reported having less of a reaction than women. So boys don't shed their feelings when they grow into men, but they do seemingly cry less. Why? Well, some are quick to blame societal structures, but there's also a bit of biology behind it too. The American Psychological Association reports that testosterone, which floods young boys' bodies during puberty, may actually inhibit the crying reflex. Meanwhile, prolactin, which is found in higher amounts in women and stimulates milk production after childbirth, may promote crying. But this isn't the end-all reason boys don't cry. When society teaches men that expressing their emotions is unacceptable, they repress them instead. Niobe Wei, a professor of applied psychology at New York University, has been studying how emotional repression affects boys. Her research has shown that boys form deep and meaningful friendships in early and middle adolescence that are just as emotionally intimate as the friendships young girls develop. But by age 16, they've distanced themselves from other men, even though the desire for those strong bonds remains. Other research has shown that this is about the same time men start falling behind in school. A 2013 report found that boys who strive for good grades are mocked by their peers. Meanwhile, boys who participate in unmasculine but more expressive activities like music, art, and drama tend to get better grades. Better grades can lead to better colleges, so proving that you're manly to your teenage buddies can have lasting consequences for the rest of your life. And it can even cut your life short. Age 16 is also the point where male suicides begin to rise. Psychologists believe that the correlation with emotional repression is not coincidental. Men who are depressed are less likely than women to ask for help. So while society is quick to say, man up, it may ultimately be hurting all of us. It's 2016, go ahead and cry, whoever you are. So an interesting kind of um, hypocrisy or double standard we could say, is that men are often questioned about whether or not they can man up or if they're too soft. But women are never asked things like this. They're generally not asked if they are woman enough to do anything. Um, and so men are judged more harshly than women for taking on roles that are not traditionally uh, considered male, being bakers, being stay-at-home dads, being nurses, um, things like that. And these are sometimes referred to as gender atypical behaviors. However, the need to appear masculine doesn't really help build the necessary skills for successful relationships or for self-awareness. And so uh, when a person engages in these gender atypical behaviors because th they enjoy it and it fulfills them, sometimes this can lead to what is known as gender role strain because of the way society responds to them. So gender role strain is striving to live up to unrealistic societal expectations which often results in a variety of psychological problems. It's difficult to meet the gender role ideal for a man as defined by our society. Men are asked to never show emotion, fear, insecurity, etc. Um, but that's just not being a human. And so this can lead to what is sometimes referred to as gender role conflict. And gender role conflict is an issue for many people across cultures. It's linked to violent and sexual aggressive behaviors, negative attitudes towards gay and lesbians, towards women, and towards racial mi minorities. So many men actually feel stigmatized by the traditional gender role ideals and instead choose to display positive masculinity, which is a healthy way to deal with gender role conflict. Whereas the previous um, behaviors that I mentioned, sexual aggression, negative attitudes, those are, would all be unhealthy ways to deal with the conflict between how you feel inside in terms of your gender and how society expects you to act, especially if there's some dissonance between the two. Okay, let's watch a video on how um, Disney kind of portrays these gender roles for men. Woohoo! It's Gender Roles Week! Y'all know how much I love gender roles! How many of you have seen a Disney movie? Like a billion of them, right? We're all varying degrees of obsessed. Research has shown us that children incorporate the movies they watch into their play and identity development. It's an active site of socialization, our learning about what's what in the world. 
which is why I think that Disney is a really interesting place to examine gender roles. So to recap, for those of you that are unfamiliar, gender roles are the set of social expectations that are assigned based on your sex. So they're the clothes you're allowed to wear, the activities you're signed up for as a kid, the hobbies and careers that you're encouraged to pursue. They're also the behaviors that were punished or rewarded for. Got a vagina? You should be nurturing and sensitive, domesticated, accepting, graceful, and passive. Not too outspoken, all right? You don't wanna be a bitch after all. If you have a penis, toughen up, man, don't cry. You should be active, competent, competitive, and maybe a little aggressive to show people who's boss. Now, there are two main problems with gender roles. One, they're forced upon people straight from the womb, and those who don't abide are teased or shamed for it. And two, gender roles in their purest forms result in submissive women and dominant men, and that leaves the landscape for gender inequality. So Disney, much has been said about Disney's gender stereotyping of women, and I mean, there should be. It's pretty intense, especially the older films. But what about the men? The most obvious issue for dudes in Disney, I think, is body type. The princes are always big, tall, muscular, almost always white. Hercules is the prime example, of course, but like, he is a Greek god. There's also Gaston, Tarzan, John Smith, Prince Eric, The Beast, The Prince in Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and Snow White. Did they have names? Prince Aladdin is also pretty cut, although for whatever reason, he seems a little more evenly portioned to me. Men who aren't tall and muscular are often portrayed as an outcast or subservient and weak. Many Disney films climax with a battle between two guys, with the best man winning pride and respect, and usually a woman. Ah. So nice being a trophy. These are some of the subtle indicators that in the perfect Disney fantasy, domination is central to being a real man. Now men in Disney also find themselves on the opposite side of the damsel in distress issue. While women in Disney films have often been told that they need a man to save them, there's a man that's expected to be the knight in shining armor. It tells men that they should be not only physically strong, but brave, emotionally unwavering, unquestioning in the face of danger, knowing exactly what to do and when to do it, or risk looking like a fool. And you don't wanna like a fool on the battlefield, but clearly home is a different issue. Disney men are almost always portrayed as being completely dopey and incompetent when it comes to taking care of themselves and stuff around the house. Good thing they had their domesticated women to act not only as lovers, but as a maid. Disney also caters to a fairly heterocentric worldview. Everyone is straight. And men chase women, always, unrelentingly, only if she's hella beautiful and thin, though. As all the Disney dudes are chasing the Disney ladies, we erase LGBT relationships, tell boys that they're supposed to be active romantic pursuers, and tell girls to sit around and wait for a guy to make the first move. Remember Ariel? Girl, if you like someone, get it. And the burden of making the first move shouldn't fall squarely on a guy's shoulders. Make your own destiny, people. Still, I do think Disney deserves some credit. They're getting so much better. They're both a reflection of our culture and an active creator of it. And I'm optimistic about the future. Just gotta keep putting a little pressure on, keep things moving, you know what I'm saying? Alrighty folks, so this video was part of a collaboration week on gender roles in our daily lives. So check out the links to everyone else's videos down below. And until next time, stay braless. So we've talked about gender stereotypes already in this lecture, but let's take a moment to really make clear what they are. So gender stereotypes are defined as commonly shared beliefs about males' and females' abilities, personality traits, and behaviors. So they're assumptions, and they're usually, usually negative, um, and they're based solely on a person's gender without regard for the person's individuality at all. Um, and gender stereotypes are deeply ingrained in our culture and in our psyche. Gender stereotypes develop at the same time as our gender identity when we're in our formative years, which really shapes our brains for the rest of our lives. And we develop these gender stereotypes when we're kids, even if our experiences as children don't match the stereotypes. For example, a kid that has a dad as a nurse uh, will still say that a nurse is a job for a girl. And as adults, gender stereotypes tend to persist, and they can be seen in the jobs that we take and the way we treat our coworkers based on their uh, genders. So gender stereotypes are especially resistant to change. For example, agency is a um, concern with one's self-interest, such as competition and independence, 
and it's considered to be higher in men, whereas communion is a concern for one's relationship with other people, and this is concern, uh, considered to be higher in women. But these are just stereotypes that people adopt as being truth. So some of the stereotypes that um, it's common for men to adhere to, and it's worth noting that this isn't true of all men, um, but men that are kind of um, conforming to these stereotypes as they've been conditioned or taught by our society. Um, so some of them include emotional unavailability, which is the idea that men should be the provider, the problem solver, and that is how they should show their affection. Um, and so they're often uncomfortable with emotions, and it's common for them to believe that their partner is too emotional. Um, and so the problem is that this leads their partner to feel like their emotions are being ignored and not validated, and this leads them to not feel as connected to the man. And we know one thing about sex for women is that it is more emotional than it is visual, or physical, and so if a woman doesn't feel emotionally connected to their male sexual partner, it's very hard for them to become sexually aroused and enjoy the sexual experience. Another stereotype that some men might adhere to is independence. So this stereotype argues that men should not ask for support, but should be self-reliant and stoic. And the problem here is that this really prevents men from being vulnerable with their partner, getting their emotional needs met, um, being willing to seek guidance, for example, go to therapy. Um, another one is that men should be power, uh, powerful and aggressive. And the stereotype here is that men are more aggressive naturally than women. And studies do show that this is a real gender difference. Men universally demonstrate more aggressive behaviors than women beginning in childhood. In fact, 80 to 95% of violent crimes are committed by men. So the question is, are men biologically wired to be more aggressive, or is this just a product of a society that um, says that men should be more aggressive? Um, the next common stereotype is denial of fears. And the stereotype is that men should hide their fear from others and themselves um, so that other men don't dominate them or humiliate them. But the thing is, is that fear is a necessary part of courage. And it's a natural part of the human experience. And then the last, uh, and then the next stereotype is protection of his inner self, which is the idea that men should keep their true self hidden around other men because those men are his competitors. And they should keep their true self hidden around women because opening up will make him seem unmanly. But the problem is that not being our authentic selves can lead to a whole host of psychological problems and destructive behaviors like aggression, drug abuse, um, things of that nature. We're going to watch a clip now on kids discussing gender stereotypes in the media. Can a truck change how people feel about a guy? Which man is sexier? Truck. Truck. Lock. That one is way more sexy feel. That's a man wearing the pants, so that shows that men are in charge. Manly means to not cry, not be a sissy. Men like work hard and they do all the sports and stuff. Rah! Man up means toughen up and unemotional go through it. I like drawing and I like birds and flowers. It's sort of like very stereotypical to assume that only girls can wear pink and play with princess dolls. You should be able to do your own things and do what you want. Some people don't like what the stereotype is. My brother, he's the same size in clothes as my mom. Sometimes he like wears her shoes or like her jacket or something. My uncle is a chef and my dad cooks like all of our food. <laughs> crafting. I love crafting. 
origami sometimes. And I also like to do all those things because that's me. That's who I am. I joined hip hop when it was just one other boy. It was just us and four other girls. I play with girl toys and boy toys. I don't really care which one is meant for boys or for girls. I just play with them. They're toys. If I were to describe the perfect man, the words would be smart, not judgy, and kind, and he likes caring for animals. If you try to go against the stereotypes, then you can. When you go your own way, it feels good because you feel free and you can do what you want to do and you don't have to do what other people say. Another gender stereotype that is not uncommon to see men adopt is invulnerability. Um, so the idea is that being emotionally vulnerable is a sign of weakness. However, this can cause a man to become emotionally insulated, which makes a person numb to all feelings, including happiness. And so the way that a person becomes emotionally insulated is when they see emotional vulnerability as a sign of weakness and so when they have emotions uh, like sadness bubble up they just stuff it down stuff it down stuff it down and eventually their brain goes okay we don't feel any emotions anymore and then the next um, stereotype that men sometimes adhere to is a lack of bodily awareness and so uh, the Stereotype is that men will ignore the physical signs of stress like headaches, back, high blood pressure in an effort to just like appear tough. And so research shows that men who adopt ch traditional gender role ideals have greater uh, physical health problems and are actually less likely to see a doctor, which is obviously not a good call. Uh, and then another stereotype is that men are driven to succeed at work and so their worth is measured by their income or status. And this really puts so much um, pressure on a man and they end up putting a lot of time and effort into their work. And this can cause them to deny um, himself time for family or for leisure, for alone time to just like decompress. Another stereotype that some men adhere to is denial of their feminine qualities. So um, the idea is that a man should always be in control of his emotions and that emotions are for females. Um, and this can result in an emotional detachment that really does not lead to a fulfilling life. Um, another stereotype is avoidance of physical contact between men. So some men feel like they should not be affectionate at all with other men and that they should only be affectionate with women if it's going to lead to sex. But the truth is, is that humans need affection and touch is actually necessary for our survival. Um, men sometimes adopt rigid perceptions and these perceptions might include that men should be independent, logical, and aggressive, and that women should be passive, nurturing, and dependent. And these rigid perceptions can lead to relationship problems, to discriminatory behaviors, or even to depression. And then uh, finally, some men have a loss of their male spirit and experience depression. Um, and this could be due to the idea that's placed upon men that they should adhere to their gender roles that are defined by society. But this causes a denial of exploration for their true gender identity and can result in self-attacking thoughts and shame and guilt. So if a man does develop depression, to recover, he's going to need to confront his emotions and actually challenge some of these gender stereotypes. Okay, so for lecture activity two, I'd like you to consider the gender uh, stereotypes that we've been discussing for males. And if you identify as a male, I'd like for you to tell me two of these gender stereotypes that have affected your life, your behavior, your thoughts, your feelings. So just choose two and then give me two sentences on how you've been affected, how you've adhered to them, how other people have put pressure on you to adhere to them. However you want to approach it is fine. So just give me two sentences on uh, each of them that you choose. 
And if you are not someone who identifies as male, I'd like for you to think of a male in your life that you've seen be affected by these gender stereotypes and do the same thing. So tell me um, two of the gender stereotypes that you've seen reflected in a male that you know and how it's affected their life. And give me two sentences on each for a total of four sentences. Okay, so let's talk about female roles. Um, and so one of the things that affects females is uh, how they prioritize their career if they choose to have one. And so women are increasingly considering their career priorities and are challenging the traditional feminine roles in work, in relationships, in parenthood, and in politics. More and more women are actually prioritizing career above marriage. In fact, single women report that they are well-adjusted and happy with their lifestyle and that they don't actually think about marriage um, because they're currently focused on their career. We also see that as women kind of become more empowered, perhaps, by these careers, more women than ever are leaving abusive relationships. Um, and perhaps that's also due to them not feeling as dependent on a working man when they're a stay-at-home mom or whatever the case may be. Also, as androgyny gains acceptance, women have more leeway in their struggle for equality, which opens the door to a better quality of life. So they're able to fight for equality and equal pay and promotions and in leadership roles, which are still things that are very much affecting women and uh, areas in which women are discriminated against. For example, there is something called pay disparity, and in 1963, the Equal Pay Act passed, but women are still paid less than men and are promoted less than men are. Um, women make 78 cents on the dollar compared with men with the exact same qualifications and education level. In fact, the U.S. ranked 78th out of 145 countries in pay equality, so we are behind many countries. Um, and this inequality, according to psychologists, is heavily in part due to gender stereotypes. Another interesting phenomenon that affects the female role is what's called the second shift. So the second shift is the idea that despite women working, they are still expected to maintain the family and be responsible for the housework, like the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry. Um, in fact, when other family members participate, they state that they are helping the woman with her responsibility. Um, and so if you have a dual career family where both mom and dad are working um, equal amounts, so they're both working full time, the second shift is the idea that when dad gets home from work, maybe that's his time to relax, whereas the mom is still expected to do what are traditionally considered um, like a stay at home mom's responsibility. So cook the dinner, uh, bathe the kids, do the laundry, um, things of that nature. Another thing that's kind of interesting is that when there is a dissolution of marriage, when people get divorced, if there is a working female, she is usually blamed for the divorce. And um, people will accuse her of putting work before family when men are really not as subjected to this criticism when there is a divorce situation. Okay, so let's watch a video on um, pay disparity. Women today earn on average 78 cents for every dollar men do, and that number has barely budged in over a decade. So with women making up nearly half the workforce today, why is the pay gap still so big? For one, data shows women are still far more likely to go into lower paying jobs. The most common occupation for women today is secretary. That hasn't changed since the 1950s. And while more women are moving into higher paying professions like medicine and accounting, if you look at single occupations, men still out earn women in almost every job. Female financial advisors, for example, make to 61% what their male colleagues do. And women who are in sales earn about 70% as much as their male coworkers. That's harder to explain, but there is some evidence that women are less likely to ask for higher salaries. And when they do, one study found that they ask for 30% less than men. That might explain some of the difference. Women are also more likely to step out of their careers or scale back to take care of kids or aging parents. And of course, that means fewer opportunities for promotions or pay raises. 
Women make up 45% of the workforce at S&P 500 companies, but just one quarter of executive level positions and less than 5% of all CEOs. So while more women are graduating from college and graduate school than men, and there's some evidence that the wage gap is shrinking among younger workers, we still have a long way to go. In fact, researchers say that if nothing changes and trends continue, the wage gap won't close until the year 2058. So some gender stereotypes that it's not uncommon to see females adhere to are the following. So the first is the um, stereotype that all women should have warmth, expressiveness of their emotions, and um, be very nurturing. So to that extent, women are really encouraged to be more vulnerable than men are. And this actually may be, um, there may be an evolutionary explanation for vulnerability in women as well. So um, there's something that psychologists refer to as the bend and bond response. And this is the idea that the more typically female response to threats is to actually seek a compromise rather than the male response of fight or flight. Um, as if there is an evolutionary purpose for females to kind of keep the family or the tribe or the village together um, when there is conflict and kind of bend and bond in an effort to um, get through the conflict. Another stereotype that some women conform to is um, that they shouldn't be assertive or independent. So some females find it hard to individuate, which is really to develop their own identity. And part of the reason for this is that women are often defined in terms of their position in someone else's life. Um, their position as a mom, as a wife, as a grandmother. And women are trained that it is their job to maintain the relationships in the family, <clears throat> um, which may involve sacrificing themselves rather than being independent, like men are often uh, socialized to be. In fact, if women are assertive in the same ways as men, they are often referred to as a bitch or pushy. So it's kind of a negative connotation that we see uh, with women that are independent or assertive. Another stereotype is that women tend to be emotional and intuitive. But research shows that men are just as emotional as women. It's just that societal norms really cater to this stereotype. And so, for example, anger is an emotion, but it's acceptable for men. And men are taught to suppress their other emotions, but that doesn't mean that they don't have them. Um, and so women are sometimes said to be more intuitive, like a woman's intuition. And the stereotype is that women are better at reading people non-verbally. And studies that have women and men interpret emotions from videos or audio do actually show that women are more accurate at this. Um, and studies show that women are better at reading facial expressions. But psychologists argue that this might kind of be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think you aren't good at this, then you're not likely to be good at it. So a man that's been socialized to not be good at reading other people's facial expressions or using their intuition might think that they're not good at it and then not be. Or maybe women have had more practice because they've been socialized to do that their whole life and women and men have kind of been told to not or that it's not important or that it's not something that applies to them. Another gender stereotype for women is that they tend to be more interested in relationships than they are in their careers or professional accomplishments. Um, but research shows that women care about the quality of their family relationships and um, achieving their career goals equally and that uh, many women are good at finding a balance between the two and finding both to be uh, fulfilling on kind of an equal level um, and not feeling like they're neglecting one or choosing one over the other, but instead that they're able to be fulfilled by both simultaneously. Okay, so if you identify as a female, then I would like you for lecture activity three to choose two of the gender stereotypes for females and tell me how you have been affected by them in your life, in your behavior, your thoughts, your feelings. And if you uh, don't identify as a female, um, I want you to think of, some, of a female in your life that you um, may see an example of these gender stereotypes working within. So um, a woman in your life or a female in your life that adheres to these gender stereotypes, 
um, give me an example of how they do that or how you've observed them doing that or how you've observed them being affected by the gender stereotypes. So um, choose two stereotypes and then give me two sentences on each for a total of four sentences. So as we have mentioned, um, more and more women are working and women's lives are generally enhanced by employment. It gives them a feeling of purpose, meaning, challenge, fulfillment, independence. One study found that women who have jobs that make them feel in control actually have less stress overall in their lives. And women managers or leaders tend to have higher self-esteem, which actually shows to improve their marriage. The only caveat to this is if their husband is threatened by their title and salary, then of course it doesn't help the marriage. Um, however, there are women who experience role strains from the conflicting responsibilities of being a working woman and a wife or a working woman and a mother, for example. So there is a phenomenon called work-family conflict that occurs when a woman's role as a mother, wife, and worker spill over into one another and create stress. But women who have family support experience less stress from work-family conflict, uh, or women with the hardy personality that we've talked about before um, experience less stress. And we know that Better work supervisor relationships also show less stress, but there is more work spillover at home when they have better relationships with their bosses. Um, another thing that happens uh, for the working woman um, and their family is called the dual career family, and this is a family in which the mother and father are both working. Um, Despite women working, they are still expected to maintain the family, like we talked about before, that's called the second shift. Women often work shorter hours than men do and change their careers more often than men. But men are starting to stay home with the kids more than ever before. Um, women in traditionally male high prestige professions often face discrimination, sexist attitudes, and patronizing behavior from their coworkers. There is something called the glass ceiling, which is an invisible barrier that prevents many women, especially ethnic minority women, from advancing to the highest professional levels. In fact, only 4.6% of all Fortune 500 CEOs are women. And women are also judged by other women who have chosen a different path. Uh, for example, working moms will judge stay-at-home moms, and stay-at-home moms will judge working moms where uh, working moms will kind of judge the stay-at-home moms for complaining about, you know, their workload when they feel like they have twice as much to do, and then stay-at-home moms will kind of judge the working moms as not taking into account that they get breaks where they get to eat lunch alone and that they get to have adult interaction and so that there are benefits and pros and cons on both sides. Okay, so we mentioned androgyny before, um, but we'll take some time now to really break down what androgyny is and um, what psychologists have to say about it. So androgyny is the blending of typical male and female personality traits and behaviors in the same person. So again, if you think of gender as being on a continuum, then androgyny would be right in the middle. Um, and so it's a functional level of gender role identity that incorporates masculinity and femininity, uh, femininity in equal amount. Psychologists argue that there would be um, healthier people if we were actually more androgynous and that we didn't adhere to these traditional gender stereotypes so rigidly and stuff down our uh, opposite masculine or feminine qualities. So... Androgynous people can adjust their behavior to what the situ situation requires in integrated and flexible ways. For example, um, traditionally, if a man sees a crying baby, he'll look for the mom. Um, but an androgynous male might pick up the child and comfort it. One study found that highly masculine male teens are better adjusted uh, when they are teenagers, but in adulthood, they become anxious and have trouble with self-acceptance. And so if they could kind of move towards androgyny, psychologists argue they might be healthier. 
Um, research shows that there is actually more variance within genders. So females are actually more different than other females than between genders. Um, people have both feminine and masculine traits within them, and psychologists are arguing that rather than referring to them as masculine or feminine traits, that we should refer to them as instrumental or expressive traits. So in instrumental traits are typically seen as masculine, um, but we could call them instrumental instead, and they are task-oriented behaviors such as assertiveness, rationality, and self-reliance. And then there are expressive traits, which are traditionally seen as feminine, but we could refer to them as expressive, and then that might make uh, help people to not feel like they have to kind of play out the gender role. So expressive traits are emotional and social skills, including characteristics such as compassion, empathy, warmth, and sensitivity to others. And then kind of ideally, psychologists argue that we would be able to engage in what's called gender role transcendence. And this is the notion that to be fully human, people need to move beyond gender roles as a way of organizing the world and perceiving themselves and others. Um, so gender role transcendence involves going beyond the rigid categories of masculine and feminine to achieve a personal synthesis. And to be our most authentic self, we really need to stop acting out the roles that society has socialized us to behave within and instead explore our uniqueness. So the idea is that true self-actualization, becoming the best version of yourself, being a fully functioning person, meeting your full potential, would involve gender transcendence. Okay, let's check out this clip of um, androgynous, they're actually models, but I think they do a good job of describing what it's like to be androgynous and how they've been treated um, because of their gender expression. All of my life, people, like one of the first things I've gotten so many times is, I don't understand you. I would say that growing up as a tomboy was definitely hard. I got made fun of by boys and girls at school. You know, none of the boys liked me or thought I was cute, and girls didn't, I didn't fit in with girls. I started modeling and like skirts and stuff, so I hated that. I stopped from modeling completely from when I was like 16 to, I want to say 19. It kind of took a toll on me and my self-confidence, mainly because I wasn't doing stuff that I feel like I was meant to be doing. They have to put a label on it, and I just don't, I don't get it. You don't have to be a man to have short hair and wear men's clothing. After high school, when I was living in San Francisco, I met a couple cool friends when I was in theater class, so they were really awesome. It was through these friends that I started to have confidence in myself, and liking myself, and loving myself. This photographer in LA uh, by the name of Toshka Turnquist reached out to me and she said, your look is so androgynous, that's what you need to capitalize on. So she started photographing me a bit more in an androgynous fashion. For example, she was like, you know, don't wear as much makeup, let's mess your hair around, and uh, certain, just embody certain masculine characteristics and mannerisms. And I found that it was not hard for me to do any of that, it actually felt a lot more more natural than wearing tons of makeup, crazy hair product, really stylized outfits, and trying to be really girly and feminine. So working with her kind of opened my eyes and showed me a whole other side to myself that I'd never even explored. And then I noticed people reacted really positively to that. I have found like going on dates with guys and they're like, no, keep it like that. But then I've also had the opposite of a guy, like I had a wig on for a shoot where I had long brown hair and he was like, you look way prettier like that. And I was like, ooh, I'm not seeing you again. Now in my career, I work with people who accept how I look and what I present and I think they like it and they want to show it. And I think it's great to be around supportive people that aren't trying to put me in another box. Instead of feeling self-conscious about the things that I used to, like not having a typical women's body, now I'm like capitalizing on the things that I used to be self-conscious about. So I did like a, a shoot like last week and we were shooting in a 7-Eleven, like the, the parking area. And this lady was like, she got inspired by us. She was like, I want my daughter to be just like you. So it was really cool. Now I can embrace who I am and I don't have to change anything and alter anything about myself and that feels good. I love that I am androgynous in my look, in my dress, maybe even in my behavior because I don't feel that I have to be limited to just one thing all the time. And if I can show that to other people and they can be more comfortable with themselves, I think that's ultimately the greatest thing.
That is it for chapter eight. So please don't forget to submit your lecture activities and also complete all assignments associated with this chapter. And we will see you on the next one. Have a great day.